Good morning and welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God, His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. Sharper Iron is underwritten by the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. On this Tuesday, February 15th, we're studying Luke chapter 9, verses 18 to 27. After Peter confesses Jesus to be the Christ, Jesus teaches his disciples what that means. He is going to suffer, be rejected, be killed, and be raised from the dead. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's Word today, we have with us regular guest, Pastor Sean Denzer. Pastor Denzer serves as Director of Worship for the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod and Chaplain at the International Center in St. Louis, Missouri. Pastor Denzer, welcome back to Sharp Iron. Great to be back with you. Let's talk context, Pastor Denzer, as we get right here in the middle of Luke 9, what should we know about the gospel and where Luke's been leading us up to coming up to this text today? Sure. Uh, very interesting. It, it happens in all the Gospels right before the transfiguration of our Lord. So, uh, And we'll see that at the end of our text today. I think that there's kind of a hint, and it's a little bit of a puzzle to some of the scholars. But I think maybe the simplest uh, explanation is it's prepping us for the transfiguration, which comes right on the heels. And after that, there's a healing, and then we have the second prediction of the Passion, and this is the first one. So it's a key moment. Uh, since Jesus takes the time three times to prep us and to prep his disciples for the passion that's coming and how important it is uh, so that we ought to pay attention to it. And it follows shortly after the feedings, uh, feeding of the 5,000 in Luke. In the other Gospels, you have both feedings, the feeding of the 5,000 followed by the feeding of the 4,000, um, which emphasizes something about our Lord's uh, care and nourishment for his people and uh, and and certainly that he is the good shepherd who's come to take care of his sheep. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, I think, you know, Luke has been building, he, he's been building for a while to something like this. You know, you, you look at the miracles that Jesus has been doing, the teaching that's been there, you've seen some reactions and obviously some questions about Jesus. And, and now he's going to turn that question to his disciples, not only what they've been hearing, but what what do they think? What What is their confession? And so, I mean, I, I think we do have one of those climactic moments. It, there's almost, I think there's a, a series of them right here in Luke chapter 9, leading up to that moment where in 951, Jesus is going to set his face to go toward Jerusalem. And it's, I mean, all of, I don't know how to, how to put this, all of what we're seeing in his Galilean ministry, that's not the end game. He's going somewhere. And he's with this text in particular, I think he's he's really starting to make that turn that becomes very apparent later in this chapter. Definitely that we're moving to the cross. And and this is the point in uh well, I think in what we're about to hear next week, probably with the transfiguration, where we see especially how the disciples don't quite get it. And if we were looking at some of the other gospels, we'd have a key part with Peter that we'll probably talk about. Uh, that really shows the disciples are not totally on track with the main point, which is the suffering, death, and resurrection of Christ. Yeah. So let's go ahead and, and take a look at this text. Again, we are in Luke 9, beginning at verse 18. Now it happened that as he was praying alone, the disciples were with him. And he asked them, Who do the crowds say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist. But others say Elijah, and others that one of the prophets of old has risen. Then he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, The Christ of God. And he strictly charged and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And he said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death 
until they see the kingdom of God. That is our text for today. That's Luke 9, verses 18 to 27. Pastor Denzer, as the text begins, Jesus is praying. It says he's praying alone, although the disciples are there with him. Yeah, I love that. How does that work? <laughs> I, that's, well, that's kind of what I was wondering, too. Okay, well, he's praying alone, but the disciples are there. Which which is it? I'm not. Maybe he's uh, sort of like in the Garden of Gethsemane later, where he goes off by himself to pray, but he tells his disciples, the three at least, uh, Peter, James, and John, to stay there and pray. Perhaps something like that. I think but it's more maybe than just sort of like that. I mean, I, one, uh, many people have observed how Jesus goes off for time by himself. Some people have said, you know, here's his self-care. I don't know if that's really the point. But but it is interesting how much of those key moments in the Passion or Holy Week, we'd call it, right, are, are hinted at, right, are prepped for or, or are you know, mentioned in some way before it happens, whether it's Jesus telling Peter how it's going to go, uh, that you'll be sifted, right? Here, we we have this pattern that he is by himself. And even if his disciples are with him, he's still by himself. And I think that's already a foreshadowing of this suffering, this unique call to be the Christ that he has. You mentioned Jesus' prayer as perhaps self-care, as, as some would, would say that. And I, I think I would push back against that because Ooh, when I, here. I mean, and I imagine you too. When I see Jesus praying in the Gospels, I don't. He's not taking care of himself. He's. I think he's usually praying for his disciples. Like Grant. I mean, in the Garden, he does pray, you know, that his Father's will would be done. And it seems that that there's that struggle within himself. But when I when I watch him praying, particularly at a moment like this, and I suppose it does not say Jesus prayed this in Luke chapter nine, but but given the other circumstances under which Jesus prays. It seems like in this situation, if, if I had to speculate, I would think that Jesus is praying for his disciples who he's about to ask them this question that they would confess truly. I mean, I think he's praying not for himself, not a self-care thing, but he's praying for his disciples who are under his care. We certainly see that in John's gospel. And we have this extended prayer, the high priestly prayer, people call it in 17. Uh, yeah. And it's not about it's hardly about him at all. It's it's if anything, it's that the Father would be glorified by glorifying him so that others would hear, so that his disciples would be set apart from the world, that they would be one in his word, etc. It's it's interesting that, you know, whatever this little note, not besides a historical fact, that that now Luke has made the point, right? He this happened in the context of his prayer just with the disciples, there alone together at least. It does prompt him to to contrast that with the crowds, right? What about those crowds that aren't here? What do they say I am? That certainly does seem to be a part of Jesus going away from the crowds, is is in a sense to say his goal is not to become a popular leader. He resists every effort of them to rush him into the throne room or anything like that. Um, he's not here to be liked by others. He's not here to bring peace, but a sword. Um, and whenever Jesus and his words are present, they have a dividing uh, character to them. And, and that's why his apostles are set apart and why his church is called out. So, yeah, that's the, the question then. Does single out the crowds? Jesus asks, who do the crowds say? The disciples have a variety of answers. Take us into that back and forth, that first interaction, the question of Jesus. And then when the disciples answer, what maybe some of the insight into what the crowds are thinking with these answers. Sure. John the Baptist uh, helps us with some of the context back in verse 7, right? Herod uh, was perplexed about all this stuff. Somebody said John was raised from the dead. Uh, some said that Elijah had appeared. I mean, it turns out if we read in the gospel, we already heard this, right? And uh, and Herod says, no, it's got to be John because I beheaded him. Uh, but uh, but but who's doing these things now, right? So uh, he's becoming interested in Jesus. Uh, so that's some of the background to John the Baptist. We recognize John spoke fiery preaching. Is is He had some kind of authority there, although I don't know if it's ever said of John the way it is of Jesus that he spoke with authority and that people marvel at that. Nevertheless, John's pulling the crowds out into the wilderness, and Jesus is only more so. So, so he's the most immediate person that is called to mind. Uh, the other one is Elijah, right? There's this tradition that Elijah's going to come. Uh, supposedly, that's why they leave a seat blank at Passover, right? Uh, because Elijah's coming, he better have a seat available for him if he shows up. 
Um, Jesus himself has this discussion, right? If you're willing to hear it, John the Baptist is Elijah who is to come, the one that's mentioned in the Old Testament that he's going to come before the great and terrible visitation day of the Lord. Uh, and the other thing uh, that one of the prophets of old has risen, that's very interesting that that's the way they put it here in Luke. Um, elsewhere, it just says that he's the prophet, uh, which most likely harkens back to Deuteronomy 18, where Moses says, there's going to be a prophet that will arise among you who will be like me. Uh, so interesting that Luke mentions this risen, right? Uh, is this risen from the dead or is it just somebody who pops up from among the people? Uh, either way, it's calling our attention back to that Deuteronomy passage. Sure. And I think, you know, I mean, with, with John the Baptist and Elijah and, and the prophets, all of these answers, it, it seems that the the crowds, they have sort of the right idea about Jesus, but they're they're not all the way there. And of course, we're going to see that the disciples are not there either. But I mean, John the Baptist, as, as you mentioned, Jesus has talked about John the Baptist. And, and back in chapter seven of Luke, basically you, you get the, the point from Jesus that if you believed John, you'll believe me. Yeah, you know I mean, if yeah. you, you, you know, so I mean, like by answering John the Baptist, while that's not right, they're on the right track with that. And I suppose similarly with Elijah and also with the prophets, that, that these are answers that they're on the right track, but they're incomplete answers. And I think that's that's one of the the things that we should we should see from this too. That yeah, okay, you're on the right track, but you're not saying quite enough about Jesus if this is all you understand about him. Yeah, there's a way in which it seems so many of the most devout Jews, right, especially the Pharisees, they are trapped in this they're trapped in this lifestyle of expectation and waiting and 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 their resistance to the fact they're resistant to the idea that he's actually come they're resistant to what they see in front of them which which can't be explained as just another one in the series uh, and maybe John the Baptist has shown in some ways that he's not just another one in the series either that's why Jesus, of course, says that he is the Elijah who is to come and says elsewhere, like in Matthew's gospel, right, um, all the prophets prophesied up until John the Baptist, which is what makes him the greatest among those born of women. And yet uh, not as great as the least in the kingdom of heaven, right? Because now something new is coming with Jesus Christ. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that's a good way to put it. They're not, they're not pagan, uh, re- they're not utterly rejecting the word of God by these answers. But um, on the other hand, so much has happened and sh- so much has been witnessed in Jesus's preaching that it- it's starting to become that way. I mean, there's a way in which even Jesus, you know, he, he sends the 10 lepers back to the priests. Uh, he doesn't, he acknowledges the whole Old Testament religion and way of life. He himself undergoes all these laws willingly. Uh, and there is a so so to speak a tolerance um, for all of that in this period where he is walking on the earth and accomplishing our salvation. But things change dramatically when when the curtain is torn, when when uh, he rises from the dead, and beginning there, and especially beginning from Pentecost uh, at Jerusalem and into all the world. Now there's a requirement that things change, um, that that Jesus be recognized as, as the fulfillment of all of it, which renders all of these things that always pointed toward him in the past uh, obsolete if you hold on to them without him. We've had this elsewhere in the Bible, uh, in Acts, right? Uh, that uh, or in Hebrews, I should say that uh, Jesus is the body that cast his shadow all the way into the Old Testament. But once the body comes, if you're clinging and looking for the shadows, you're missing the point. Yeah, yeah. I think I think you and I had that conversation on, on Sharper it, yes. Iron. Well, yeah, about the, the the body casting the shadow, hold onto the body, not the shadow. The 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 confession here of uh the prophet, I think is is significant too, because and again, it's not complete. And yet it I think it shows that they've been listening to Jesus because if if we go all the way back to Luke chapter four, that the inaugural sermon of Jesus in Nazareth at the synagogue in, in many respects is par- paradigmatic, programmatic for his ministry, he calls himself a prophet there. You know, he says no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. 
And so, it, I mean, it seems, again, they've been paying attention, but they haven't connected all the dots, at least it, in, in the crowds. You know, they, they know he's a prophet, but they're not sure precisely what that means. And we've seen you know, other moments. The one that comes to mind particularly is in the, the calming of the storm where the disciples in the boat are left, in, left asking, who is this man? You know, and th- so these questions have continued to, to circle around Jesus. We've got some incomplete answers from the crowds. But Jesus is not talking to the crowds at this moment. As you pointed out, he is, he's alone, he's with his disciples, and now he's going to turn the question to them, who do you say that I am? And, and maybe just before we get into Peter's answer, just the, the fact that Jesus turns the question to them and wants to hear what they have to say, what they have to confess, I think that's a, just a significant thing in and of itself that he would turn the question to them and not leave it sort of what's going on out there. He wants to know, what do you believe? Yeah, I, I think he believes they're going to connect the dots here, uh, and they kind of do. Uh, but they're, but I love the way you set us up here, right? There's something not quite, something is still missing. And that's what he's going to get at. But, but I don't think it's all answered in just what Peter says. That's just the prompting to fill it all in. And, and as we've already hinted at, that, and we've heard in the text, right? That's actually what causes them to not quite get it. Uh, sure, so. sure. Okay, well, well yeah, okay, Peter's so answer. Take right? us to Peter's answer. Yeah, what does he say? You're the Christ of God. That's a very simple way to put it here in Luke. It's interesting. It's different in the other Gospels. In Mark, it's you are the Christ. I suppose that's the simplest, right? Uh, and in Matthew, we have the longest one that we probably know best. Uh, you, I tell you, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Um, maybe the fullest uh, explanation or, or fullest sentence, at least, recording of it. Uh, interesting. But um, yeah, the Christ of God, which is an office. It's it's not a last name for Jesus. Christ is his office. He's the Christ. Uh, and and that means the anointed one, the Messiah in, in Hebrew. Uh, and so he is the, the figure that is the hope of the expectation. He is uh, this figure that has elements of a king, elements of a shepherd of his people, elements of uh, somebody who's going to be uh, a savior, certainly, a judge maybe, even like the Old Testament judges, uh, that he's going to be a king, that he's going to rule over his people uh, in uh, righteousness. Uh, he's going to rule over the nations, perhaps powerfully. Um, he's, he's going to subject them to himself, kiss the son lest he be angry. Uh, so, um it's a packed word, we should say, already at the time. Uh, so, so to say he's the Christ is to say it all. We should say here, um, this is just another example of if you're tuned in to the way people think in this period, the Second Temple Judaism period, this is, a, this is absolutely something that declares him to be God. And the fact that Jesus doesn't say, no, you're wrong, um, is another sign. He receives this statement as true, and that is a claim by Jesus that he's God. Every once in a while we hear kind of uh, uh, critics of the scriptures or of Christianity say that Jesus never claimed to be God. He did. There's just so many things like this moment where he had the, the perfect opportunity to say, that's not who I am. Uh, that's not who I understand myself to be. And that's not what Jesus does at all. He receives worship from people. He, he says, yes, you know, even, that's the best answer possible when you call me God, the Lord. Mm. Uh, that's, I think that's a really important point because you do, you do encounter that kind of skepticism about Jesus and texts like these where he receives that worship as God are a very good indicator that, yes, he did believe himself to be God and did confess himself to be God, particularly, and I think just to, to add one more thing to that, when you combine the fact that Jesus receives the worship and he has acknowledged that you should only worship God in the in the temptation of, of Satan, that was one of the, the temptations about you know falling down to worship him, mm-hmm. and Jesus responds, no, you only worship God. So when you put that side by side with the fact that Jesus receives the worship, that, that only just bolsters that case. And and again, I mean, it, it's an important point as to how we read the scriptures and understand the scriptures and confess the scriptures that, you know, just because you don't get the chapter and verse where Jesus says, I am God in those exact words, 
Although I, and I, I'm probably you probably do. He says, <laughs> but there's, he says there's, before Abraham was I right. am, which I mean that's you got to be pretty obtuse to miss that one. That's <laughs> right. His opponents got it because they picked up stones to kill him right away. You can't say that. Who are you know? Unless it's true, um, that's right. Well, and G, uh, the point you bring up, right, that Jesus doesn't you know spell it out. All right, and on page five it says I'm God, so we'll move on. Uh, Jesus is just way more interesting than we are. Uh, he doesn't give us this kind of boring. Book. Uh, and even in the way he plays, if I can use that word with his disciples here, right? You know, what what do they say? Let's t- test the polls, right? What are they saying about me, guys? Uh, and, uh, and, but here, you know, who do you say that I am? He's asking questions so that faith can respond to it, uh, so that, so that they can come along with him, so they can grow in his words and be led to this by the Holy Spirit. And, um, and, I think this is a big part of what makes it so enjoyable. The message of Christianity is is a delight that Christ is always eliciting these things by His Holy Spirit and by His Word out of us. That uh, sometimes we hardly we hardly realize we could we could know and believe, but this is what His promises give to us. It's it's far different than saying you know uh, submit to the facts, uh, you know, or or to give you a book and say well memorize these instructions and then you could be a Christian, you could be one of my disciples or something. Um, there's there's a richness to it um yeah now so we've we've been saying here pastor denzer about jesus receives the worship now you and i were were talking previously that there's a a lot i hate to say missing but luke's account of this is shorter than some of the things that we get and there's a few details left out from what matthew and mark record so peter gives his answer and then luke moves on right away to Jesus saying, don't tell anybody about this. But there's there's some stuff there about how Jesus receives this answer, particularly with what we've been saying, that I think is, is worth our while to make sure we, we know the full context. So can you, like, what does Jesus think of this answer, the Christ of God that Peter gives? Sure. I mean, there's great benefit in looking at the Gospels individually to, to see, you know, as a whole narrative, right, a whole story, a whole uh, presentation of the Lord's uh, ministry that certain points are brought out by the way it's ordered, the way it's laid out. Uh, and I don't think that's a false uh, recognition. At the same time, we believe that all scripture is God breathed. We don't really think that Matthew, Mark, and Luke are bringing their own perspectives entirely and only, uh, but that the Holy Spirit has inspired this. So I have no difficulty uh, doing what they call harmonizing, looking at other sections of the scripture that interpret the scriptures. Uh, and so, yeah, we do get different highlights in some of the other parts. You know, when we get to the transfiguration, I won't steal all their thunder, but he talks about the exodus with Moses and Elijah. Uh, and uh, you don't get that in the other gospels. So, uh, you know, Luke has some details that we don't get in other places. Interesting. Uh, here, the ones that we don't see in Luke is, yeah, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. Matthew kind of has the most full presentation. He says, blessed are you, um, uh, Simon Bar Jonah, son of Jonah, uh, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. In other words, it's not actually a conclusion that Peter comes to on his own, like you know he's calculating things, and all of a sudden it dawns on him, oh yeah, three plus two plus one miracle equals this is God. Uh, but this is in fact the Holy Spirit, the Father Himself, by the word of Christ and and by the ministry uh, that has that has brought this confession about in him. I, I love that. I mean, I said a moment ago, Jesus is asking questions. You, you might think he's Socratic in this. He's going to, the answer dwelled in you all along, and I'm just going to pull it out uh, like Socrates out of his students. But uh, it, it's nice to kind of contradict that with what uh, Jesus says in Matthew, right? Uh, no, that's not really what happened, even if it to you it might have felt that way or seemed that way, that slowly you came to a conclusion. Actually, God my Father has revealed this in you, which is nice. And, and there's where he, he uh, in Matthew's gospel, he gives to Peter and to the whole church uh, in Peter's person uh, the, the office of the keys, uh, 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 you know, if you forgive the sins of any, if you bind anything, it's bound. If you release it, it's it's released. Uh, and says that on this rock, uh, you're Peter, but on this rock uh, of the confession of faith, um, of the ministry of this confession, uh, the ministry of Christ Jesus and his gospel, I will build my church and the gates of hell won't stand against it. Um, and none of that's here. Uh, instead, all we get is don't tell anybody anything, <laughs> which is kind of interesting. Um, 
<laughs> well, it, I mean, it is, it, you know, how Luke just moves the narrative right along almost as it, I mean, when you do read in Matthew 16, you know, it, it is a very climactic moment there. And and here in, in Luke, you could almost just kind of skip over it and, and keep going and not realize this is a really big deal that Peter has made this confession. And, and even to the point that Jesus says, you know, this is, I'm going to build my church on this confession. And I, again, I, we want to make sure we pick up the emphasis that Luke gives by by abbreviating it or by recounting it in a shorter way and maybe putting the emphasis a little bit later on, on on what Jesus is about to say. But at the same time, we don't want to miss that this answer is is true. And Jesus wants us to confess this before the world because on this confession, and I love the way you put it, he's going to do the work. This is a confession that was given to Peter and Jesus is going to build his church in on that confession. And so I, we just don't want to miss that because Luke recorded it differently. Again, we want to catch all of that that the scripture has for us. Correct. And the fact that he just jumps into what almost seems to be an about face into some totally unrelated topic, we should see that that is not what's going on. He is going into an absolutely related Mm -hmm. topic when he gets to predict his uh, suffering and death. When he says, you can't tell anybody yet because if you want to say I'm the Christ of God, uh, this you got to know what the Christ of God really is when it boils down to it. What 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 is the significant thing of this office? The duty of this office, and that's what he gives us here. Actually, um, so uh, so much of what is given to us in Matthew's account um, is really present here, uh, but but we're led along in the similar way that disciples are by Luke uh, mm-hmm. that we would maybe not quite understand it, or that we would have to, well, we'd have to go through this cross, this suffering, this rejection, and this resurrection in order to come to the recognition of uh, this is the thing on which the church is built, that this is what gives the forgiveness of sins. This is why we can say, I forgive you in the name of Christ Jesus. Um, So so really, I do think it's all there, uh, but uh, uh, Luke doesn't take any moments to spell it out for us. And Peter gets that's spared right. something in this gospel as a result too. So that that's true. And we can we can pick up more of that conversation on the other side of the break. You're listening to Sharper Iron here on KFUO. We're talking Luke chapter nine with Pastor Sean Denzer. We'll be right back. Please stick around. Did you know that Lutherans are helping new American immigrants get settled? How about struggling church workers in need of support and refreshment? And we assist at-risk children and provide disaster response to hurricane victims. Through LCMS recognized service organizations, we are doing all this and more. I'm Rahema Kavuga of Lutheran Church Extension Fund, and I don't want you to miss out on hearing what your brothers and sisters in Christ are up to. Visit interesttime.org to see how your support gives life to these works of mercy and love. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Tuesday, February 15th. We're studying Luke chapter 9, verses 18 to 27 with Pastor Sean Denzer. He is director of worship for the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod and chaplain at the International Center in St. Louis, Missouri. Pastor Denzer, prior to the break, we were talking about the confession Peter makes. Jesus is the Christ of God. Jesus tells his disciples, don't say this. And then he speaks. And as you were saying, what he says is very closely tied to what Peter has just confessed. What does it mean for Jesus to be the Christ of God? That's what Jesus explains. What do we get in verse 22 as Jesus tells his disciples what it means for him to be the Christ? Sure. The Son of Man, that's another title. Jesus does talk in the third person. It's maybe a little weird, but I suppose if you're the Christ of God, you get to do this. Uh, and, And it could be a great synonym for the Christ of God, right? Now you want to run to Daniel and all these places in the Old Testament that use the phrase Son of God and put that in the column along with Messiah, along with anointed one, along with um, uh, savior and judge and all these other titles. Uh, but what is it? What is the thing that must happen? That's a, that's a very strong word that this must take place, that he suffers, that he's rejected. Uh, and he's even rejected by uh, all of the leaders of the church. And he is killed and on the third day be raised. 
So, uh, I mean, many perhaps amazing things in there. Certainly, this has been prophesied in many places in the Old Testament. Isaiah is probably the easiest one to see this, right? That he talks about his suffering servant, and he talks about that he's rejected by by men. He's a man of sorrows, etc. cetera. Uh, so, so certainly that has been there. You do see, by the way, another connection to the prophets, that just as the prophets were all rejected and killed, in fact, by the people who were supposed to be running in the show, the prophets and the kings, or the, or the priests and the kings, uh, so Jesus is going to suffer the similar fate. But one thing's quite different, that he's going to rise again on the third day. And, and sometimes we forget this either in our in reality or just in the impression we give when we're observing Lent, for example, uh, when we're going through Holy Week or reading the the four Passion accounts, we almost get into this mindset that we don't know the end of the story, and that's that's really false. Uh, it, it's also false to to ask the question, you know, well, the disciples didn't know what was coming actually three times in each gospel, so it must have happened, three times they were told in no uncertain terms that Jesus was going to rise from the dead. That's what he has the, that's what he rebukes them on the Emmaus road for, right? Did, uh, why are you slow of heart for believing this? The angel says that, right? He's risen just as he said. So the whole story was laid out here right from the beginning of how this was going to go. So so why didn't the disciples remember it? Um it's this misunderstanding that is more than just they didn't put two and two together. It's a little more than just they they were poor at paying attention. There's something that is resistant to that message and, and resistant to that understanding, even so, even so much that they wouldn't be pleased to hear that he was going to rise again, right? Uh, we see in their reaction, right? If Philip in one place says, well, I guess we better go die with him, you know, that's, that's what's going to happen. Um, they don't even hear that he said that he's going to rise on the third day. It's a slowness of heart, um, uh, which doesn't get expounded upon here in Luke's gospel, but we have a much fuller picture of it from Mark and from Matthew. So what what do we find out from Mark and Matthew as to this resistance that they have to Jesus' passion prediction? Sure, Peter's the first to the show every time. He's, he's the first to come out and say it, you're the Christ, the Son of God. And then he's also the one to say, pull Jesus aside and say, all right, I don't know where you got this idea. This is horrible, right? You're not going to die. You're not going to suffer or be rejected. We're not going to let that happen to you. Um, Peter steps up for Jesus, he thinks, pulls him off to the side, has the, you know, manager you know, with the talent moment and tries to say, this is not how it's going to go. Um, it's a foreshadowing, frankly, of what's going to happen in the transfiguration also, uh, the next pericope. Uh, and and in the other gospels, that's where uh, Jesus says the kind of striking and famous phrase, almost as famous, I think, and familiar to us as you are the Christ, is to say, well, Peter, you are Satan. Get behind me, Satan. Uh, you don't have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Which is, uh, I mean, how can Peter be so right and then be so wrong in the next paragraph? The answer is the thing he didn't grasp and was unwilling to believe is that the Christ of God, the Son of Man, is here to suffer and die. And this is the unique and most taxing, I think, uh, and and mind-boggling part of Christianity, that our God is not just here to be worshipped and adored and and acknowledged as God, uh, that would only be fitting for a God, but that he's here to give up his life and his possessions, his own son, for the sake of, of people who don't do a very good job of worshipping him or acknowledging him in their lives, that he has mercy. Um, yeah, but that too is what uh, the Lord told Moses, right? Uh, that too is what Elijah was preaching, what John the Baptist was pointing to when he said, "Behold, the Lamb of God." And uh, and this is this is in fact how our God shows His greatness, uh, like that collect in the church says, uh, "You show your divine power chiefly in showing mercy and pity." And we should say, chiefly, He is most God when He is suffering and dying on the cross for our sins. Well, and I mean, you you mentioned this in passing. I thought maybe we could talk a little bit more about it. Jesus uses the very strong language here that the Son of Man must do these things, mm, that it's yeah. not, it, it wasn't a, 
a accident of history or you know circumstances just fell in the wrong places and the right people you know the right people the wrong people were in the right place the wrong place at the right and wrong time however you want to phrase yeah, that yeah, yeah. but this was actually something that god had jesus god had to do it's a, it's a divine necessity is sometimes the way we talk about it talk a little bit more about that oh i think you know we we love the atonement of christ you wouldn't ha- it wouldn't take a whole lot to figure out that the death of jesus is a significant event it's mentioned in all four gospels and paul's talking about it all the time but how exactly would you describe that and, and there's where i think sometimes out of uh, joy over it that people you know want to express it in a different way or with a different analogy but sometimes out of uh, uncomfortableness with it like peter has um it, it gets explained in so many different ways uh, even something like God shows, like I said, like God shows his love uh, by sending his son to die, could risk reducing his death only to a demonstration of something, like just an object lesson to really drive home the point that God loves you a lot. Uh, we even say this sometimes kind of colloquially, right? God spread his arms out on the cross to show that he loved you this much, right? Like with a little kid. Um that does not actually grasp what the atonement is, right? It doesn't actually grasp that he was suffering on behalf of our sins, uh, uh, bearing the punishment in our place, that he was giving us his righteousness by his death, that, that by his death many would be accounted righteous, as Isaiah says, uh, that, that he would be, uh, that we would be, he would be taking our sins, um, crucified for our sins and raised for our justification, that he would be making us right with God, that he would be um, triumphing over sin and death. So, uh, I mean, uh, his death is very rich, of course, uh, but the necessary, I, I think, sometimes we look at this and, and many of our hymns sit and marvel for a while about how amazing, how unfathomable how kind of mind-boggling the death of God is, the death of the Son of God on the cross could be. Um, And that leads us to think like God's just really laying it on thick. And we want to say it the other way. We want to say God can do anything, therefore God could have just thought us to death. And, And maybe we're more comfortable with that. So we almost think that's really what happened. God just, you know, snapped his fingers from the throne room and all our sins were forgiven. And then this is just a show or a demonstration or or a outward sign of some hidden invisible reality, <laughs> to borrow a phrase. Uh, and that's not what it was. And the word necessary here, must happen, I think is at least one of the places in the scripture where it really clues us in. No, this is really accomplishing it. And this is God's plan. Um, and the fact that Jesus repeats it three times and says, this is really important, guys. We got to understand this also shows that this is no accident. We mentioned already Jesus in the garden, Father, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. As Lutherans, we have that fantastic hymn. I hope everybody knows really well. Uh, A lamb goes uncomplaining forth, which we sing during Lent uh, and often during Holy Week. And I do think the translation that we had in the older hymnal was a little stronger. It talked about uh, Christ. It's a dialogue between the Father and the Son. It's imagined, but it's it's very much what he was saying in content, at least. Um, yea, Father, yea, most willingly, I do what you demand of me. My will conforms to your decree. I do what you command me. And, and that combination of willingness with command, which for us, we tend to leave those as opposite words, right? Either you command me to do it and I'm doing it out of obligation, or it's a free will, something that I came up with to do, in which case there's no command. With Jesus, these two things meet and are fully in harmony. His will is glad and is is fully willing to uh, submit to the, to the Father's expectations, both in punishment and in a positive command. And he does this in our place. Uh, and this is what's going on in the incarnation and suffering and death of Jesus. Well, and just to, to take that all the way back in Luke's gospel, and I think we might have talked about this when we looked at the text in Luke 2, where Jesus is the 12-year-old in the temple. It sometimes may not come through as strongly in the way that the English is translated, but it's the same word where Jesus says, 
to his to Mary and to Joseph, didn't you know that I had to be? Or, or I mean, it's the same word. Mm-hmm. I I must be either in my father's house or about my father's business. Such that this this willingness of Jesus to do what his father commands is is present throughout his life and ministry, not just in these passion predictions, but throughout. He's always about that work of what must happen for our salvation. And even by the end of Luke's gospel, after he's risen from the dead, you know, he'll tell his disciples, didn't you know that the scriptures must be fulfilled in yeah. this way? Yeah. Oh, I know? love I mean, it. So, I mean, about his father's business, which is the salvation of sinners, uh, or in his house. And what house is this? This is the house of slaughter. This is the house of sacrifice. Mm-hmm. And Jesus is the true sacrifice. Again, that richness of the atonement and that by no means is it an accident or just a picture of anything God is doing. It is God at work for us. So Jesus is going to come back to this a couple times. His, he's going to tell his disciples more than once, three times it's going to be recorded for us as to what he tells them must happen. So we'll we'll see more of those as we go through Luke. This is the very first one. You've filled in some of the blanks that, that Luke skips over the reaction from Peter, but he then goes straight to what Jesus says in response. So in verse 23, Jesus says to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. A very rich text, probably some of the most well-known words of Jesus here, Pastor Denzer. Help us, what's what's the connection that Jesus is making? And maybe is there any thoughts as to why Luke does want to jump to this, it seems, so quickly here? Uh, I mean, I think by putting them next to each other, it shows us that that we're following what he's doing, that we're connected with his death and resurrection um, I can't help but think of baptism, right? And the way P- Paul talks about it in in Romans chapter six, that we are joined through baptism, buried with him even into his death, and therefore connected with his resurrection as well. Um, so, not only is not only is it a, a random, isolated article of faith that it was necessary for Jesus to suffer and die, and and that that's what it means to be the Christ of God, and and that yes, the crucifix or you know the picture and the and the message of Christ's death has to be an important part of Christian worship. Great, but but that that is so directly connected and formative and conformative even of our life as Christians too. That that. One, we will be imitators of our master, as it says elsewhere in Jesus' teaching, uh, that um, d- that all of our sufferings and difficulties are to be comprehended and understood and born uh, with uh, with faith in his cross and death and resurrection, uh, that that he is he is the way to to bring us through these things unscathed. All of this is at work. Um, and uh, and we see that Jesus is not thinking of himself. Hard not to think of Philippians, right? That that he um, did not consider equality with God, being the Christ of God, something to be clung to. Uh, but he willingly emptied himself and took on the form of a servant and suffered all. Uh, so we also then uh, suffer in imitation of him as well. And that's what he says, right? Whoever would save his life, uh, cling to it all you want. You're going to lose it in the end. But uh, astoundingly, the one who loses his life for my sake will actually keep it forever. Will actually have it be saved. Um, I, I I have found this passage in in my ministry and my thinking and conversation with others so helpful. For as you know, we're all cheaters. We all want to have just one little phrase, John three sixteen, or something that we can toss out and say, "Well, this is this is all it is." Every, that says everything. And I'm really lazy, so I'm done. <laughs> um, uh, I don't. I haven't found one yet. Maybe the words of institution might do it. Uh, but this one is one of those that is up there for you know. Give me your definition of what a Christian is. I think this is close, and I probably would want to read what Jesus says before it about what he does first. Uh, but uh, you know, what is a disciple? A disciple is the person who abides in his word, like John 8 says. And a disciple is the person who denies himself, takes up his cross daily, and follows Jesus Christ. I think that's a fine short definition. And what I've found so fruitful in our time is, I think we live in a time where we already hinted at it already, didn't we? Care of yourself is really the most important thing. If there's any sin or something to be on guard for, it's that you're you're being too hard on yourself and that you're not... Um, you know, you're not giving yourself enough credit and you're not taking time for me. Jesus does not say that. 
Uh, Jesus That's does not let true. Uh, Peter try and talk him into that. Um, and, you know, he doesn't go into a long thing about sin or even being redeemed by it here, which which might be appropriate since we're talking about suffering and death. You know, but he does express it this way, that um, the cross is about daily denying ourselves and instead growing into life that comes from Jesus. Um, uh and I think that's just very, it's something we need to hear, we need to preach, we need to have at the front of what we do. And I think it answers so many questions. I think it answers especially the question why people are frustrated that Christians would talk about the law, would talk about good works, and would dare to ever be critical. There's a way in which those outside the church only hear our criticism of them. I'm suspicious that they have a conscience still that is working on them. And that's what they're really mad at. I mean, they'll be really mad at God if they're a little mad at us. But our message, which comes to us just as much as it does to them, is that Christianity is about denying ourselves. It's about repentance. It's about um, not being good at everything all the time. It's about not being a self-achieved winner. And it's certainly not about doubling down on I'm right and I would never admit that I were wrong. Uh, no, we repent. Um, our religion, and and the reason that can happen is because there's forgiveness of sins in what Jesus has done. Uh, so, so I, I think this is helpful for those who who struggle with who they are, who have things that go so deep, even as their bodies and their minds and their feelings that they they think they're doing something. You know, they're wired almost, or they feel as if they're wired wrong. They can find real comfort in this, that Jesus says, that's all right. Uh, my my faith, my my way of life is about denying ourselves. So you have a very explicit and direct way of de- having to deny what you want, what you feel, uh, uh, even who you think you are or at times. Uh, that's all right. Uh, that's the cross that you're going to bear, and you follow me. It's very interesting also, I mean, again, what does it mean to take up your cross, take up, this disciple will take up his cross. Obviously, Jesus has made a distinction between what he does and what we do. And certainly none of us is is expected to die on the cross and rise again in order to redeem uh, all the sinners in the world. Thank goodness. Um, No, that's what his cross has accomplished. But but our crosses bind him to him or ought to be received that way. That's something that can join us to him. And 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 this is the origin of, of the Lutheran, uh, Christian word, use of the word cross, which is to mean any kind of suffering, finally, especially that that has to do with suffering for being a Christian, facing persecution, suffering for the sake of his name and his truth. But finally, it does comprehend all the struggles that come from denying ourself. In this world and clinging instead by faith to what God and his word has promised. Uh, calls it a cross. And in here, I, I, I can't say it any more beautifully than Bach has done uh, in his uh, a cantata uh, about how weeping and wailing and, and sighing and lament are the daily bread of Christians. Uh, anxiety and trouble, uh, these are the Christians' daily bread. Uh, very sad thing. In fact, the the tune uh, Bach reused in his uh, B minor Mass for the crucifixion of Jesus. It's the very words he said, crucifixus est, that he was crucified, died, and was buried. Uh, no surprise. But then Bach changes it in the cantata, right? Uh, these are all the signs, these crosses and struggles, the, the signs of those who believe in Jesus. Uh, this is also what we see in the church, whenever the pastor blesses us in some way, he makes the sign of the cross. Uh, you can expect to bear one then, but we receive it as a great blessing because we know it marks us as those who, are, who belong to Jesus Christ, who are joined to the Christ of God. And therefore, we know that he'll bring us through these difficulties. We know that he's answered for our sins, that he can redeem that. Um, and that to deny ourselves does not mean that we will be destroyed, but it means that he will make us what we ought to be, that he will forgive our sins, that he will reconcile us to himself, that he will give us life that lasts forever. That, that's such a, a wonderful way of, of going through these the, the suffering of this life. What a, what a great message of hope that our Lord does give to us. And, and what often I think is 
we we take is boy that sounds really hard and, and yes but but the way that you're you're explaining it i think is is such a, a beautiful gospel comfort that in this way our lord actually connects us to himself shows us that we do belong to him and that the sign of the cross that's made over him and that we make over ourselves daily is such a, a wonderful reminder of that we got about five minutes here pa- Pastor Denzer, and so just to make sure we, we keep moving, tell us a little bit about verse 26. The Jesus says, whoever is ashamed of me in my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory. Mm, this also is a very profitable one for our time, I think. Um, it, it would make sense. If you're ashamed of the Christ of God, the Savior of the world, all these things, uh, uh, you're going to be, then the Father will be ashamed of you too. So we have a Trinitarian connection here. We have, uh, Jesus says elsewhere, right? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father, uh, et cetera. Um, and that's brought out, by the way, in that hymn I mentioned, where you have the Son and the Father having this dialogue, same thing we see in the garden. Uh, what I love about the way it says it here is it's whoever is ashamed of me and of my words. This is helpful for our time where I don't think anybody has a big problem with Jesus, certainly not a vague impression of him. Uh, a lot of people are quick to say Jesus wouldn't say this or Jesus wouldn't like that or, or that doesn't sound like the Jesus I believe in. Um, but here he says there's an identification and a joining together of me and my words, which means you can't you can't hold on to Jesus as some general idea or as you know the person without also believing what he says and clinging to that and trusting in that and holding it true, right? So our confession uh, our, our, or our shame, right? Those would be two opposite things. Either I'm going to own this, this I'm going to say amen to that, or I'm going to say, nope, I'm, I'm not going to acknowledge that. I'm, I'm ashamed. Uh, I don't know anything about that. Uh, and, and maybe interesting that Peter would be mentioned in this context, right? Uh, whoever's ashamed of his words also can't ha- hold a claim to Jesus, right? This is true in the law things, right? So you can't say, uh, well, yeah, sure, those things might be in the Bible, uh, but but I believe in Jesus, and and as long as you believe in Jesus, it doesn't matter what the Bible says. No, he claims this as his word, as, as the book that's all about him, as at the end of Luke says very clearly. Uh, so therefore, we need to cling to these words, especially when they condemn us, when they tell us, sorry, you have to deny yourself on this, and you may have to suffer something as a result of it, and follow him, right? Uh, also, though, the, the clinging to him and his words of the gospel, right? So many things that Jesus says, whether it's, you know, I've come not to serve, but to be served, but to serve and give my life as a ransom for many, uh, that I've come that they may have life and have it to the full, that these words are to be treasured and and, and held on to and, and delighted in, and not the opposite of ashamed, right? Uh, uh, because that is, in fact, what keeps us and 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 what what brings to us the Father's word at the last day. Uh, not to deny, but to gladly receive and, and, and to not be ashamed of us, but to acknowledge us as his own too, because we're connected up with Jesus, his suffering and death, his salvation. With about two minutes left, Pastor Denzer, help us to, to summarize this text. Any points that we miss that you want to cover, wrap things up for us, give us the good news. From That's Luke right. Now. We'll leave 27 for the next guy. So, uh, <laughs> uh, it, it, Who is the Christ? still needs to be asked, right? Uh, people say he's a lot of things. Uh, a lot of people through history have, have either, you know, tried to comment on Jesus, and most of the comments have been fairly favorable. He's he's a prophet. He's He was a, he was a good teacher, all these things. Uh, Jesus lays it all down here and says, no, I, I'm the Christ of God, and that means something about me. It means my words are, are the words that give life, not just something to be entertained or an interesting thought. Uh, and it, my words are connected to this action that I do to suffer and to die and to rise again. And this is what it means uh, for me to be the Christ. Likewise, what it means for you to be a Christian is to deny yourself, to uh, uh, let your old Adam be drowned daily, not to cling to the things you can hold on to in this life only as if they were the highest good. Uh, in fact, to believe against what you see, uh, to trust my word even more than what others say and, and what you see and what, what, what seems to be right in this world, uh, because my words give life. My death, my blood uh, is, is what saves us. And, and those who, who trust in that will live even though they suffer death. Um, 
And just as I have gone through cross and suffering, that does carry over to all of my followers, uh, that, that in you will pass through your sufferings uh, also and pass through death unless I should come again first. Uh, but those who die to themselves in me are in perfect condition for my Father to raise you from the dead, as he will do for me. Pastor Sean Denzer is Director of Worship for the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod and Chaplain at the International Center in St. Louis, Missouri, helping us today with Luke chapter 9, verses 18 to 27. Pastor Denzer, thanks for being our guest today. Absolutely my pleasure. I am your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. If you have any questions about Luke chapter 9 or any of the gospel according to St. Luke, please send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org. Use the open mic feature on the app to send a message to us. We always love to hear from you. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again tomorrow.